hello everyone, welcome. My name is Faye Ellis. I'm Principal Training Architect here at Pluralsight. And I'm talking today with Simon Allardyce about the Pluralsight AI Skills Report, uh, which was published recently. So Simon, could I ask you to introduce yourself? Thanks, Faye. Uh, so I'm Simon. I'm a principal author at Pluralsight. What I do these days, most of the time, is I focus on making content to um, talk about emerging technologies like AI, blockchain, quantum computing, and not surprisingly, a large part of that this year has been generative AI. I do not expect that to change anytime soon. So let's dive a little bit into the report. So we're here to talk about the Pluralsight AI Skills Report. So these are the highlights. And we basically interviewed over 1,200 executives and IT professionals to understand the rapidly evolving situation with AI. So what we really wanted to know was, you know, how organizations are preparing for the future, how AI is already impacting people, and how to drive lasting value and really to succeed with this awesome technology. So one of the most interesting stats that came out is that around 87% of organizations plan to increase their AI spending over the, over the next 12 months. So Simon, is it a surprise to you that the vast majority of organizations, they're either planning to deploy AI over the next year or they already have? Um, not, not really. Kind of the thing I think that's worth recognizing is despite the, the general downturn in tech spending, the fact we're all being asked to do more with less is the, the cliched phrase, but still kind of when it comes to that question of so you're spending more on AI, the normal response is, oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're doing that. We're spending money on that because it's generally understood this is important, that despite all the hype and despite all the drama, this is not an area anybody can ignore right now. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what do you think are the top reasons for using AI? And is there a common thread for all of us? Yeah, it's always a little bit difficult to talk about the, the kind of normal use cases, because I think we all kind of grew up with this idea that AI would always be something exciting and science fiction -y and groundbreaking. But a lot of the real world applications, at least the first round of them, are a little boring, kind of dull, kind of mundane. It's, you know, it's kind of that response of, oh, what are you using it for? Oh, oh, customer support or, oh, automated document recognition, or, you know, you're, you're able to streamline some of your business processes, big whoop, but, but that's where the first benefits often are. These kind of unremarkable things like speeding up the time it takes to make an HR request, because we don't have to have a person who's reading and categorizing everything. So, you know, any kind of service delivery, um, whether that's internal to a company, HR, finance, procurement, or, you know, or external services. It's not that exciting, but that's where I'm seeing a lot of that first use. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I heard about recently was with Delta Airlines uh, creating like a little chat bot that you can talk to if you've got a delayed flight. So, you know, finding out the latest status, you know, what's going on with my flight and why am I entitled to any compensation, more importantly, that kind of thing. And another one I heard about was uh, from Toyota, you know, putting their car handbook or like the little manual that you get with a new car, instead of giving you, you know, that physical manual that you've got to like leaf through when you when you when you get a panic because you've got like a um, one of those alerts come up on your dashboard. You're like, oh, my goodness, what does that mean? You don't have to leaf through the car handbook anymore. Instead, you can actually query the car using your voice and using voice commands. And it's going to tell you, oh, that little light on your dashboard just means that your tire pressure is low or something like that. So that's that's the kind of thing that I'm looking forward to, things that are going to make my life easier. Right. And I think people do. It, you know, it's absolutely the case. People do underestimate the benefit of convenience just to make something a little easier to do, to remove the, the speed bumps out of the way, to just make it easier to do that thing you were going to do anyway. Um, and that's where we're seeing a lot of this most effectively being put into place, not with some, you know, new groundbreaking, massive AI pivot our entire business model, but just start helping all these little things from the bottom up. Yeah, baby steps. Right. 
So I've got a few more interesting stats. Um, a few people are actually holding off on AI. So what we found was 55% of organizations planning to, planning to deploy AI technologies over the next year. 20% of organizations said they already have, but a massive 25% said that they're not actually planning to deploy AI technology over the next year. So I'd be interested to understand what do you think is behind that? So when I saw that number, you know, I, I was more surprised by that kind of remaining chunk of people who said they they don't plan to deploy AI because it gave me this immediate inner response of, of, hey, are you sure about that? You know, kind of followed by this thought of, you know, you might have deployed it already, right? You know, because I think there's, I do think there's a lot of people that are still in this mindset that to deploy AI means that you have to do this large scale you know, top-down, massive initiative in the in the business, you know, pivoting the organization. But the reality that we're seeing is it's often just more bottom-up implementation. It's first individuals and teams that are just kind of baking little bits of this into their own personal workflow or stuff for their team. It might not feel disruptive and dramatic, but it's still incredibly impactful. And and it kind of reminds me with this this idea of people saying they're not doing AI. It reminds me of people I know who who will tell you, oh, I never use any kind of AI on my phone. But they unlock their phone with face recognition and they use speech to text to make text messages. And they go into their photos app and use the automatic object recognition. And you kind of feel like saying, you know, that's all AI, right? You're, you're not getting away from this. It's all there. Yeah, absolutely. It's starting to creep more and more into our lives without us realizing it. And actually, in some ways, that's a good thing because it means we're not, you know, we're not going all out building, you know, these like ambitious systems and spending a lot of money. We're still getting the benefit of uh, a lot of AI being built into the tools that we use every day. Right. And I think things like coding companions, for instance, um, helping helping people to code, people like me to code more quickly and more efficiently. Totally. So, so for organizations who are holding off, uh, you know, maybe holding off because of budget constraints or, you know, lack of skills in, in, in the specific areas or maybe satisfied with their current setup. Do you think organizations who, um, you know, holding off for that reason, do you think they're making a mistake or are they getting left behind? Or do you think they're just, you know, waiting to see what happens and uh, working out their strategy? Yeah, I think that's, the kind of last comment you made, it's a real indicator. I see, if, if I had to say the two most common mistakes I've seen over the last year um, that, that organizations are making are kind of diametrically opposed. One is the, the mad rush to be seen to be doing something, anything with generative, you know, just generative AI, all the things. How do we squeeze that into every project, whether it's useful or not? But the flip side of that is almost this kind of unspoken desire that, yeah, I know we're going to wait until things have settled down. We're going to wait for clarity in the market. And I think that's also a mistake because we can recognize, uh, yeah, it's a mess right now. Everybody working on this is making mistakes. They're, they're going down rabbit holes and then realizing, oh, that's not what we wanted to do at all. Coming back, it's, it's false starts. But that's unavoidable. The thing is, you know, if you're in a position where you're thinking, well, what I want is, you know, best practices for a multi-year generative AI deployment. Well, we don't have them. We don't, we aren't along this, we don't have this lovely maturity curve that you might have in like cybersecurity or cloud where you can kind of say, hey, we have years and years and years of knowing how companies move through this. We don't have that yet. So we've kind of got to embrace this idea of given that's true, given the fact we might make mistakes, is it worth holding off for a while? Well, only if you want other people to eat your lunch. It's not. Yeah, absolutely. Have lunch or be lunch. Um, would you say that it's a period of experimentation then at the moment? It has to be. And I think it's not just it's not just experimentation, but I think it's, it's slow realizations that that everybody's coming to at the same point. A, an example I've used a couple of times is if you go back, say, mid-2023, Everybody was saying how, you know, prompt engineering is the skill of the future. Everybody needs to become a prompt engineer. And, and everybody kind of jumped onto this for a while. And sure, it's, it's super important right now. You have to know how to do that if you're engaging with this. 
But there's been this slow realization of, oh, that's not what we're going to be doing like a year or two years from now. We're not going to be going to the websites and typing in long and complicated prompts because the tools are just going to get better at integrating this functionality with them. So it's it's almost like everybody realized that at around the same time of, oh, prompt engineering is not the next big thing. It's just a blip that we have to go through right now. So we have to kind of engage with the fact that we're making mistakes, we're experimenting, and we are all just learning and realizing, oh, that's where this is going to go. Yeah, I love that. And I love the idea of, you know, staying relevant by being flexible and, uh, you know, just evolving our skills as the landscape evolves. So kind of leading on from that, how concerned should people be about job security? And if people are concerned about job security, what can we do as, as technologists to, you know, protect ourselves and make sure that we stay relevant into the future? Yeah, yeah. It's so... You know, you occasionally get people trying to oversimplify this. Either it's going to destroy all the jobs or no, it's going to be fine. Everybody's just going to have new skills. Um, I think it's naive to think that this is not going to affect jobs. Of course it is. It is already. It's already having kind of that impact. The answer for most technologists is kind of you you have to embrace it and not in a perspective of, oh, I have to frantically learn some new skill because all my old ones are dead. It is more about this idea of how do I use this stuff as an assistant, as, uh, you know, there's a reason why we see the term co-pilot being used so much because that's the right perspective to have. How do you use this to help you? How do you take what you've learned, your own understandings of this, and use these tools to just make it easier, better, faster. So for example, if you're a software developer, you should be using some kind of AI augmentation assistant tool right now. End of story. I mean, whether it's GitHub Copilot or Tab9 or or just using a chatbot, if you're not doing that right now, you're you're in danger of falling behind. And it's not hard to do. So So get to that. And even if somebody's watching this thinking, well, I would, but I'm not allowed to because my company doesn't allow them. Well, then do it at home because you still need to start adding that skill to your toolbox. So kind of just jump into them. You sh- Most business people should be using some kind of generative AI tool regularly right now just to keep up with that. Subscribe to a couple of newsletters. Make sure you know what is going on in the market so that you're not in that paranoid state of, oh, they're, they're going to come and take my job. It's like, no, there's tools you can use right now. And one final benefit I'll say is the great perspective to have is with particularly with generative AI, it's not like anybody's suddenly got five years on you. We all started basically a year ago of just realizing, oh, this is happening now. Nobody has incredible amounts more experience than you could get. You could be almost where everybody is with a few weeks, a few months of application. So now's the time. Get to it. Yeah, absolutely. But I want to bet that we'll still see job uh, job advertisements and job descriptions with asking for five years of prompt engineering experience. I'm sure they're out there. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so my final stat is that 95% of executives and 94% of IT professionals believe that AI initiatives will fail without staff who can effectively use these tools. So what can organizations to do to close that skills gap? So what do they need to do to create, you know, like an effective AI upskilling program? Right. You know, I think there is probably more than ever, there's a general understanding of, oh, you can't just go out and hire people. You can't just go, oh, hey, we're, we're building these new products. Let's go out and find 100 new engineers who have years of experience on this, because those folks don't exist. So first is this assumption of you need to work on upskilling, reskilling your own folks. That's going to be an incredibly valuable strategic approach to have rather than acquiring this stuff. But to the second point is, is kind of, if you are involved in strategy, in, in project management, in C-level decisions, just make sure you're not working off old assumptions. One of the common problems I've seen is organizations that kind of look at AI the same way now that they did 
maybe four or five years ago where, okay, we're implementing AI. That means we need machine learning engineers and PhD data scientists. And it's, well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, that depends on the project. If you, do you need people that can actually write a transformer or, or build an LLM from scratch? Or do you just need the option to be able to pull one of these off the shelf? That's a very different skill set and a much more easily reskillable option because we've got so many more tools and frameworks that we can just use now and incorporate into our own applications, our own systems, our own development. But it's getting kind of clear on what upskilling means because I think there's there's too much of a push towards we have to turn everybody into machine learning and AI engineers. No, not enough on the understanding of just kind of leveling up some of these skills to be able to use this stuff. And more generally, it's it's less about just your software developers, just your data scientists, and much more about this idea of how do you upskill the organization as a whole? How do you get a lot more people comfortable with using these rather than comfortable with building them? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think also, you know, fostering that whole culture of learning, learning together, supporting each other, that kind of thing. And we are all in this together. We're all, you know, learning a very ch a quickly changing landscape. And uh, yeah, it's, um, it's a fun time. It's an exciting time. Well, thank you so much, Simon, for sharing all your wisdom and your thoughts with us today. Um, if anyone would like to dive deeper into this report and really get the lowdown on the current AI landscape, how it's impacting people and what you need to do to drive lasting value with your AI investments, then you can follow the link and download the report. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Faye Ellis. I've been with Simon Allardyce and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.